uh, shock. It's just because <laughs> I need to move the mouse in order to move the body. But the other headset is firing up, and in a moment I'm going to jump back into that and, uh, and, and do a little dance just to prove it. But there we go. And there's the final slide from the previous talk. But now we're moving on to number three, which is sports stars and their accents. And it's not just about that. I couldn't squeeze anything more on the slide, but it's also a discussion around the types of sports that exist, uh, whether there are some questionable sports out there as well. So I'm really going to look forward to hearing more from everybody here about the sports maybe that you play or have played in the past and, um, and also have a bit of a discussion about um, maybe uh, sports in society as well. So um, we've got Daniel again back with us because in addition to being the founder of the Educators in VR community, yes, there he is. Um, we've got, uh, he, he's also a basketball coach. Is that right, Daniel? Yeah, that makes it sound very good. Well. I yeah. took a basic coaching certificate and my son is a primary school. My son is a primary school coach. And we, yeah, we play the basketball coach. But it's not, I'm not, Can there we go? And, and why basketball? I mean, is it a passion of yours since being a young man? Um, yeah, I uh, I heard um, I played basketball as a uh, as a kid at school. Uh, two very good friends of mine they got me into basketball. We used to play every lunch break, like many people play football uh, in the lunch break. I played basketball every lunch break, joined yeah. the school team. And um, can I just get some reactions that you can hear me? Can everybody hear me okay? Because, 10 4, Roger that. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm happy. So, yeah, basketball, um, it's a nice alternative to football. I grew up with football and then kind of switched to basketball. And uh, it's a nice, fast game. Um, also, one aspect I like with football, often you get some kids who just are brilliant from the outset and they kind of dominate the game. And with basketball, because in, at least in Europe, um, the exposure is a little less than the skills gap is different and more kids can feel that they're in the game, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's totally what you said. And uh, what about you, Shaz? You spoke about reading before. Do you play any sports? Oh, he's not there. Danny, you're out in, the, in yes. New York. Okay. What do you play? Uh, good question. I used to do soccer, which, ha, 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 being Italian soccer, right? Um, uh, <laughs> basketball, some baseball, and karate. So just to make sure everything. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, we're going to jump to the next slide. Here we go. Yeah. And it's the Olympics. Now, yes. uh, Daniel, how many of those sports do you play? <laughs> um, I run to catch the bus. I, uh, I I don't know what the second one is. Third one, skiing. I used to ski as a kid a lot. Um, kayaking, haven't done so much of that. Swimming, obviously. I used to cycle a lot in Germany, a lot of good cycle lanes there. Played a bit of tennis. Yeah, gymnastics wasn't me. Football, yes. Fencing, no. Except I've like, if you call it beat saber, I play beat saber. Okay, yeah. <laughs> weightlifting, um, when I go shopping, I do weightlifting, of course. Riding, I haven't done. Golf is not my thing. Squash, I played as a kid. Uh, volleyball, we used to enjoy archery. Basketball, yeah. So we have a few of them. I've tried most of them, I would say. Okay, great. And um, has anybody out here ever attended an Olympic game? Uh, no. Sadly not. No. Okay. All right. Well, we've got the Tokyo one that we should have had uh, in the next few months, but um, I don't know if that's going to go ahead anymore. But obviously sports is a classic topic in English exams, and uh, you will definitely need to know how to talk about that. Um, and... Um, uh, team sports as well and individual sports. Now, Danny, you mentioned some of the sports that you play. Um, Danny, could you just explain, because you've got a very different accent to me and Daniel, and um, maybe just for people to hear your accent over there in the US, how would you describe the differences or the positives and negatives of doing team sports versus individual sports? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question because uh, even though I'm from New York, I don't exhibit any of the pronunciation or um, any of the enunciating of the words in particular. Um, I pretty much, most of my um, growing up has been done in Arizona, so it's obviously a vast difference between um, the way I pronounce words rather than those here in New York. Um, I think so, uh, individually, uh, we, we do have that culture here in New York where when we are working in, in a collaborative environment with, um, within ourselves, we tend to use a lot of vernacular. <laughs> Obviously, not very conformed in, in, a, in, a, in a specific ambiance such as this, but working with uh, in a team environment um, where we tend to use a lot of signs, uh, especially specifically in baseball. Um, another in, in karate, um, we tend to use uh, some Japanese, Japanese American, um, you know, Yamero, Ichini Sanchi, Borokusi, Chachikuju, those kind of things. Uh, and then in soccer, um, I have the, uh, the fortunate. Um, uh, fortunate uh, luckiness of opportunity to have worked with an Italian coach. So we were able to mix our Italian with it. So there's just certain conundrums within the, stat the status of the status quo, if you will, of where you're working in. So I think predominantly being in a melting pot like New York has allowed me to really just work with different vast cultures. And I'm really lucky to, to have been part of it. I hope that answers your question. I hope I didn't go into a, yeah, a little absolutely. bit of a tangent. And do you prefer individual sports or team sports yourself? I really prefer team sports because I'm more of a people person um, rather than individual. It actually, to be honest, um, I work in IT now and I think had my parents not really um, impressed upon me at a very young age to work in a team environment, I wouldn't be such a collaborative person and a bit more extroverted than I ought to be. Um, rather than working in a, in a very introverted environment, I, it would not have helped me a lot. So that being said, I, I feel more garnered to be sociable rather than just maintaining all that within oneself. So yeah, I think sports really does have a lot of advantageous effects to someone, especially from the social development standpoint and psychological as well. You learn to be very, you have a lot of gratitude and uh, you tend to be very empathetic of those feelings of not just for your coach, but also for your teammates. Um, and again, if I will, just to borrow the, the stage for just a 30 seconds additional, I had a friend of mine who, um, when I was going to um, soccer team about eight years old, um, his, uh, his sister was diagnosed with leukemia. And, um, you know, when you're part of such an immersive team, you feel like you're part of a family outside of your family. and. Um, that in itself was really amazing because I can't remember the last time I was part of that. I mean, the social interaction when you're going to your friends at the park is different than when you're part of a team environment for three, four seasons at a time. You're growing with each other. You're feeling with each other, you know, uh, through everything. And it's just uh, synonymous with being part of, of that family. And I know Daniel can also attest to that as well. Thank you. Yeah, great point. Daniel, what, what did you say about that in terms of the kind of the, the team building social interaction within sport? It's really, really important, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, like our basketball team, we were like a gang of brothers uh, in the best sense of a gang. Um, there was an unspoken understanding on a physical level because the speed of basketball, you need to read each other's body languages. So that, that survives after the game, you, you carry that around. Um, and yeah, I mean, the communication is not only verbal there, it's the body language, the interaction. And when you share, I think it's also, when you're playing a game at full speed, your body's pumping, your blood's pumping, your adrenaline's going. And that is a formative experience. And uh, you know, if, if you're really into it, you, you have this sense of flow. And sharing a sense of flow with other people is an incredibly powerful thing. It's, it's at a different level. Um, you fuse to become a unit, which is more than the individual parts of, 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 the, of the group, if you like. It's, it's, yeah. it's, really, it's one of the great joys of life to be part of a team that you're contributing to. And yeah, and sports, that's one of the reasons why sports is so beautiful. Um, and in, in some ways, actually, in some ways, it's, it's very different, but joining up in VR, us being here in this room, we're sharing something that 
we can only share here, kind of like people in a team share something you can only share in a sports team. You can't get it in a, in a, um, yeah, in a pub. In a pub, you have a different kind of uh, relationship. On the sports field, when you're playing, it's a very, very different kind of relationship. Just like, like on the just describe what it's like to us to meet and collaborate here in VR. It's, there's a parallel yeah. for me. Definitely great. Um, Big Chad, you had a question. Big Chad, are you there? Do you, have, do you want to speak? He was around a minute ago. I think he might be down the bottom again. Okay. Um, okay. What are secrets to success then? Um, let's consider some of those. Daniel, uh, we'll, we'll kick off with you. Um, what do you mm-hmm. think is the key to be a successful sports star? Oh, I'm not a successful sports star. Don't listen to me. <laughs> um, I, uh, the key to enjoying sports, that's my kind of success, like just enjoying it, um, is to be willing to put yourself out there, get involved, you know, make mistakes, learn. Just keep learning and um, do it for the right reasons. Like I'm not a very yeah. competitive person. I'm a very collaborative person. If I... Like, that's why I do the coaching with the kids. I, um, I want to get all of the kids involved. That's my kind of success. As long as everybody's... Yeah. I, I would rather lose and have everybody involved in the game personally than win and thrash the other team and feel like it was kind of dominated by one side. That's, that's not for yeah. me. But then, okay. but then that's just me. I, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, not a competitive person. I like, to, I like to do well. I like to push myself. But I do best when the other team is also doing well. It's very unbalanced. Oh, the man from Italy. Uh, what about you? Do you play sports, Michael? Uh, I, I, I ski, ski, and volleyball. Yeah. If, if I can and, love ski. And, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Great. I like skiing. Um, so that's in your blood, isn't it? You're, you're from the north of Italy. How often do you ski? Often, uh, every Sunday. Oh, wow. Okay. So you have all of the equipment, all of the gear, the skis, the gloves, the hat, the, go- the goggle? Yes, I, I do um, alpine, alpine ski, Nordic ski, and uh, mm. uh, touring ski. Yeah. Yes. With, uh, okay, so it's, an, it's another kind of ski. Yeah. Uh, the ski slopes are uh, 20 minutes uh, away from my house. Lovely. Very Lovely. Near. <laughs> nice. Yeah, very nice. Well, the next question for you, and I'm going to hand the reins over to Daniel, um, is again, is to get your opinion as a fellow English speaker. And um, should certain sports be banned? What could we say about that, Daniel? Certain sports uh, be banned. I am. Oh, sorry. Is that is that directed at me? Oh. Yeah, that, Daniel, we'll kick okay. off with you and then we'll go around the room. Sure. Uh, banning sports. For me, the word sports um, is an organized, agreed type of activity. And if people agree to it and are organized together, um, I see very, I can think of no sports at the moment that should be banned if, I mean, the ultimate rule is do no harm. So as long as whoever's doing sports aren't harming other people, um, then I don't have a problem with it. I, maybe you're talking about things like um, extreme sports that carry higher levels of risk. Um, that could be. Does anybody else? Can anybody think of a sports of a sport that would harm other people? Um, maybe a suggestion could be boxing. It harms but, um, animals. It harms animals. That harm animals. animals, yeah? What's the name? Uh, hunting. Yeah. Hunting. Hunting. Okay, okay. Hunting. Yeah. Well, for me, for me, that's not a sport. That's, <laughs> that's animal cruelty. I know it's organized and they agree on it, but that's animal cruelty. That's not a sport for me. Just my personal opinion. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other? I would say uh, prize, prize yeah. fighting. Yeah, multi, like mixed martial arts, prize fighting, that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I think, I, I know what you mean. I, for me, that's senseless brutality. Um, at the same time, everyone's agreeing to it, and it's their, their own individual rights. You know, I, I wouldn't let my kids do it. Uh, I wouldn't even let my kids watch it. 
But uh, any any other opinions on that, like prize fighting? Does anybody does anybody box? Karen six six six, you look like a boxer to me. Just joke, just kidding. <laughs> we could um, we could do it. We could do um. Say again, sorry. Does box VR count? Box <laughs> VR. I was just going to say, Danny, we could uh, we could do a bit of bit of boxing here. Do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I would lose. <Yeah. laughs> well, probably I would beat you in losing. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. That's so, the great thing about the VR. Mm. Well, interesting question about banning sports. I I could only imagine it if it was something that put others at risk. If you're risking only yourself, that's, you know, like base jumping, as long as you're not hurting people, there's a high level of risk and, you know, a high level of mortality to that as well. Um, yeah, it would be hard put to say we should ban that. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, good. So it depends who we're harming. And uh, does anybody know the name of these two gentlemen? Pacquiao. Uh, no, I don't. Yeah, well done, Danny. So we've got Pacquiao on the right. I, I don't know the, the, the guy on the, on the left there, but uh, yeah, that is often a sport that we think of as being maybe um, controversial for some people. Yeah. Um, Danny, uh, you, you said some great things today. What about the dangers of boxing specifically? What could you talk about? I would specifically talk about um, post-traumatic stress and then also mm. the viability and possibility of concussions. Um, yeah. I know um, here in the United States, uh, and again, I know Daniel can probably attest to this, um, there's been a lot of scientific evidence uh, yeah. within the last couple of years, especially the Hollywood movie, which reluctantly came out, which Will Smith was actually a part of, uh, which really, uh, really covers the... Um, the um, how do I put it this way? Um, the tumultuous uh, and and, um, and and insurmountable amount of damage that a lot of football players actually uh, really ascertain throughout their careers. Yeah. Some of them even yeah. having maybe just two three years. And um, obviously there was one where there was a um, a homicide that was included on that, which um, wow. later on uh, a, a, the football player committed suicide inside the uh, jail cell. But again. Um, not getting too dark here, but, but for, for most part, I, I think a lot of sports really need to start looking at the safety measures and precautions that they're doing for not even those that are the participants in the event, um, but also uh, those who are training to be part of the event, you know, uh, including the referees. I mean, it, it is a very brutal sport, and, and that's also a, a, for hockey and rugby uh, going back in the UK as well. It's, it's just extremely violent, and when you know, of course, everyone's paying the top dollar for the best seat in the house to see it. But we're not talking, or we're never necessarily having a discussion about the safety regarding those who are involved. Because I mean, they're also not even just athletes and superstars, but human beings, just as much as we are behind these virtual headsets. And uh, it's it's pretty sad that we don't have that conversation. Yeah, that's a really good point. And we never, I, I don't know if it's ever had in schools, I mean, Daniel, is that some of the conversation you have in your college, for example, about dangers of sport? Um, not that I'm aware of, but in, in parallel to what Danny just said about American football having impact on concussion, you might not think that of football, of what we call uh, soccer, what we call football here in the UK, uh, but um, there's a famous English football player called Alan Shearer. And he, over the last few years, have, has led a campaign to looking into the effects of heading the ball at high impact. So if you imagine the goalie smacks the ball right over half the field, and at the other end, two or three players jump up to head it. And when you do that repeatedly over a career, the statistics are quite clear that you have a much higher chance of um, uh, degenerative uh, uh, brain brain uh, diseases. So he's he's... He's keeping the conversation going there about how to counteract that. I don't know how you do that in, in any sport. How do you take impact out of American football? How do you take impact out of soccer? I don't know. But we do have to consider these things going forward. If we're, you know, if we're getting our children into these sports in, with the awareness that over a long period of time it can leave them in a worse condition, then that's a conversation we definitely need to have, I think. Definitely. Okay, good. Right. Well, we've got another uh, Gigi, the psychologist. 
Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Where are you from in the world and tell us what you want to say. Well, I was born and raised in Canada, but currently in the States for school. Okay. Um, honestly, honestly, I, I would say that boxing causes a lot of, you know, brain trauma, which can resolve into bipolar disorder. I know I'm just getting really deep into this, you know, it's a psychologist to me. However, boxing and there's other sports that could harm um, mentally and could cause the death and like a lethal injury yeah. people could ex experience you know like will not be the same ever again could be paralyzed and what, but what would you say about you know the kind of the free will yeah like in the end it's people's choice to do this 99 times out of 100 I imagine you know I'm your son I'm 15 years old I come to you and I say mum I want to I do some boxing what, what would you say to that I would say that it's quite problematic but if it's by choice, I would think somebody over 18 should... It's kind of hard. This is a very controversial question. <laughs> it's... Honestly, why would That's you have question on me? It's okay, you know? Um, my opinion, you want my opinion? Or... Yeah, yeah, your opinion. My opinion wanted... is, if you're going to be in a sport that... I think the parents' consent should be um, the main goal here. I personally do not agree with people under 18. However, it is a very harmful sport. Yeah. Um, I just well, believe that parent parental consent might be more reasonable. I mean, if you already have a TBI, I do not suggest it. Yeah, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's that's you know, I, parental consent. Absolutely agree with that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, S Serenity. Uh, you, you you would like to say something? Let's come to you. I'll just turn your phone, your microphone on, please. Hello. Yes. Uh, my my daughter. Well, I live in Hertfordshire, but my daughter lives in yeah. Wales. Actually, Daniel's just disappeared. I was going to tell him yeah. about my daughter living in Wales. Hooray! Um, but she has a, for, a sport that she's 23. She has a sport that she plays that I think is fairly dangerous, and that is roller derby. Uh, it's Ooh. quite a rough What's that? sport. I know. Uh, you're on roller skates, four-wheeled roller skates. You go round a track, uh, and there's two teams. And the object is that one member of the team tries to go round and get through the pack, and they score points that way. Uh, so you get two people going round from each. You get one person from each team going round. Um, but the pack, when you get to the pack, they're all trying to knock you off the track and knock you over, and um, all kinds of tactics and your team are trying to help you through um so i've seen in that particular sport broken legs broken arms my daughter has dodgy knees and she's 23 um but she loves it and she did it she started it when she was 18 or so so it was her choice okay. and she got all the gear um i was thinking about the comparisons in sports really i mean Rugby is quite a, a rough sport, but we don't hear so much about the injuries in rugby as we do, say, in football or boxing. Um, and I just wanted to put roller derby out up there as well, yeah. as another one. Uh, but I, I would have, still have trouble with the boxing thing. And if a young person, uh, say 15, wanted to start, I do know that they have, maybe at that age, quite often, decent boxing clubs would have safety equipment like the headgear. And yeah. they would train them in fitness and things before anything else in tactics. Um, but it's still a difficult question. So I just wanted to throw roller derby out there as well and comparing the sport and views of it. Mm. Yeah, that's a great that's suggestion. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nancy. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice uh, point there. And the... Marco, what do you think? Let's bring you into the conversation as well. I mean, uh, would you, I'm your son. I'm sorry, it's a horrible thought for you. Uh, I come to you, I say, Daddy, I want to do boxing. I'm 17 years old. What do you say? Me? Uh, no. Mm, I, I would try to mm, suggest her or him to change uh, her mind, okay? Because boxing is too much yeah. violent. It's too violent. Too violent, okay. Yeah, too violent. Okay, all right, great. Well, let's move on. We've got some famous sports stars here. Um, shout out the name if you know any of these people. 
uh, Mayweather, Ronaldo, and Tiger Woods. The one on the bottom left looks like uh, Michael Schumacher, but I could be wrong. You win the prize. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Daniel, you're a, ja, Dan, you're, a, you're a German speaker. What's Schum, Schumacher in English? Uh, it's a shoemaker. <laughs> it's Ooh. A, yeah, it's an old trade, shoemaker. Yeah, it's one of those uh, interesting kind of things when you, you, you realise it. Oh, yeah, he's, he's probably descended from a shoemaker. And now look at him. He's, uh, well, he was a very successful Formula One driver. Um, I don't know, how, how's he doing these days? I don't hear much of him. And interestingly enough, he sustained an injury that was not... Yeah. yeah sure. What's the situation? He was, skiing. he was skiing in the Alps. He, I think he had a... He, he, he fell and he had a concussion, he's been in a coma, and I'm not sure he's even come out of a coma, and this was probably two years ago. He was in a very bad condition. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, Marco, you said you're a skier. Um, how can you avoid the dangers of skiing? I mean, obviously it can be dangerous. What, what do you do to protect yourself, apart from the equipment, for example? Yes, uh, using the helmets uh, and uh, go um, on the slopes uh, yeah. on a speed that you can uh, afford. Not too much speed, not too much fast. Sorry for my... Yes, <laughs> not too fast. No, that's okay. Yeah, good. Not too fast. Yeah, great. Okay, so not too fast. Moderate your speed. Uh, anything else you could add? Any advice to young skiers out there? Uh, to attend uh, school, a uh, ski school. Yeah. Yeah, take class. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're going to move to the next slide. Here it comes. So we've got a few videos lined up for you to hear some different accents as well. So let's see if we can bring those up right now. Footballers become movie stars have films made about them. You're one of the few who can. You're probably the most famous footballer in the world. What's that like? What's it like being a, a footballing superstar? It's great. Uh, this has given me motivation to, to still work hard and better in my job. But I have to say, uh, to be in my shoes is not easy. Uh, but I'm not, uh, I'm not complaining. I just, I just want to say that I feel happy. Uh, all this happened because the reason. The reason is I'm unbelievable inside the pitch. This is why the people love it. <laughs> the reason is I'm unbelievable. Um, he um, he reflects, of course. Forza not just what's that? Sorry. Forza what's... Juventus. <laughs> I thought that was a troll that entered the room, kind of trying to well, cause well, a bit of well, 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 <laughs> Hang on a minute, calm down. It, no, no. Okay, can <laughs> we, we've actually uh, put the chairs at the back of the room because we knew this would happen and we didn't want you to throw around <laughs> plastic chairs like English hooligans. But there we go, and we've got <laughs> you van Napoli in the room. Um, yeah, I mean, he's speaking about success being successful and unbelievable. Um, he, uh, he, he made a small mistake. He said, I'm not complain, he said. Um, I, I think, yeah. if I've heard that correctly, he said, I'm not complain. Marco, um, coming to you again, um, what's the correct way? Do we say, I'm not complain? I don't complain. Okay, that's yeah, you way. could say that. Yeah, that's one way. There's a different way, though, and it would explain why. Does anybody know the alternative? I am not complaining. Ta -da. There we go. You are, uh, you're correct. So we say, I'm not complaining, um, or I can't complain is another maybe uh, expression we say. But Michael, when you say I don't complain, that's just in general in my life, yeah? So it's the present simple, I don't in general complain, like in general in my life. Not necessarily about this situation. But if we're saying about a specific situation, like for example, being a successful sports star, you would say maybe the present continuous, I'm not complaining, um, or actually maybe better is uh, I can't complain. Normally we'd say that. I think you'd agree, Daniel. Hopefully I've explained that well as a fellow yeah, professional. that's right. So you have the grammar for different times yeah. or situations, and then you have the expression, the general expression, I can't complain. Yeah, there we go. All right, well, yeah. he's Portuguese, and we're going to move forward to the next speaker, and I think he's going to be a native English speaker right now. Well, let's listen to what they've got to say. Mm -hmm.
so fat you look terrible no, apparently so apparently retirement so. Is, is ruined you actually funny you say that my little girl turned around to me the other day and i just bathed her and i was in the bath as well so i got her out and you know i was toweling her down and she said daddy i love you so much but i don't like you you're so chubby <laughs> i mean i didn't think i was but uh, as long as she loves you, it doesn't matter if you're like it. She, she said you were chubby. She well, that's a weird. Maybe she doesn't know what the word chubby means. Well, He's other, maybe well, does not. chubby I hope mean not. perfect <laughs> in England? Is well, that? I would, I would think so. I would think so. How have you been keeping busy after playing soccer your your whole life? I mean, what do you what do you what's um, your day like? I mean, to be honest, I've become a taxi driver overnight with the kids. Uh, I'm I'm literally an Uber <laughs> driver now. You take them. I literally I take them from seven in the morning to the schools uh, I have four drop-offs at four different schools no um, so I get that done in an hour and 15 minutes oh my um, God. and then I pick my little girl up at 12 uh, and then the boys at four and then the boys train in a soccer Academy every single night of the week so I'm busy every night until 9 30 and then um, and then I'm at home oh my god what well, sounds like a nightmare <laughs> To be honest, it's great. I, you like it's, it's, I've been playing football for the last 22 years. Okay, there we go. I'm never getting through the slides. Um, just to pause that video. Right, um, he said a phrasal verb there. Phrasal verbs are such a key part of English, yeah? So it's what we have a, a verb, for example, pick, and we have a preposition, like up. And uh, does anybody know what pick up means? Ideally, a non-native English speaker. Should we ask um, Magic Flute, oh, Francesco, do you know what pick up means in English? I pick up my daughters from school. Oh, he's in deep thought. Yeah, what, what does it mean to pick someone up from school or from a shop? Exactly. There we go. Pick up. P I C K. Non conoscevo, non conoscevo questa, questa okay. espressione. Ah, okay. Ora sì, abbiamo Adesso. imparato una cosa. Adesso. Good. Adesso. Excellent. Ok. Se gli hai detto che era <laughs> All right, cool. Um, yeah, Marco as well, I know you're not a native English speaker, so when you watch videos like this, it's always good to try to pick out, for example, is another phrasal verb with pick. So pick out the natural expression. So we see pick up, pick out. Pick up means um, uh, get someone from somewhere, like normally in a car, for example, or the bus. The bus picked me up from the stop. And you can pick out something, for example, select. So there we go, that's phrase verbs. Now, David Beckham is clearly a, a famous sports star, but, um, and he spoke about his daily life there. It must be really difficult, mustn't it? Serenity, let's come to you if you're still in the room, or if not, um, maybe Karen or Daniel. What do you think it's like when you actually retire from sport? What do you do with all that time? Oh, goodness. Well, I suppose quite a lot of people go into coaching or things on the fringe of their sport or organising sport. Um, Apart from that, I suppose you might then do what David Beckham did and become uh, uh, an Uber driver for your family. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Do we have any Uber drivers in the house? Give me some cats and some hearts. Any, any Uber drivers? No. Okay. Well, one, one will turn up. Danny, are you an Uber driver? For the family, yeah. As long as they pay you well. <laughs> okay, no tips. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you spoke about their sports injuries in the, in, a moment ago, Danny. But what about then the other challenge for sports people is that when they retire, often in their maybe 30s or 40s, which is still very young, like what, what the hell do you do with all that time and money? Very interesting question. Um, from a US perspective, I've seen a lot of like NFL players. American football, not soccer, 
uh, or even um, uh, basketball players, sports athletes in general here in the United States tend to go into like newscasting or um, uh, work in some form of uh, statistical analytics, even on the back end of, of the sport. So, uh, or even go into coaching or management or even go into the back office of like finance of, of, a, of a team. Uh, so just because their career end doesn't mean that they don't have some kind of um, is some kind of uh, interaction with, with the sport indirectly or directly. So um, it, it's it's pretty awesome that they still have that capability of doing that, or they simply retire yeah. like that and then just be part of members of the family. I've seen that also. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think football is in particular. Uh, there are many sports where actually you can go on and on, isn't aren't there? You know, until your fifties, sixties, and seventies. Um, Marco, which sports do you think, Marco, in northern Italy, do you think that you can retire very late in? Because obviously Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo and uh, Dybala, they will not be playing football in their 50s and 60s, we don't think. Um, although Ibrahimovic seems to be doing very well into his late 30s, yeah. and Buffon did, of course, in goal. But um, what about other sports uh, that you could play until late uh, age, later in life, professionally speaking? Volleyball uh, in uh, Trento, where I live, uh, there we have a, a team that's in the high, highest level here in Italy, and uh, I, I see that there are um, players that have uh, an, an older age, for example, 42. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah, 42. I mean, that's like a spring chicken for some people than the number 42 but uh what about golf i mean this is a sport i think of maybe an older age obviously when the eyesight goes it becomes a bit more difficult when you can't bend over with your back to pick up the ball although i think they have um people to help them with that does anybody know the word for the person who follows the professional golfer around the course we don't call it an assistant what do we call them does anybody know caddy Excellent. We've got an expert in the room. Serenity, are you a golfer? My father was captain of North Oxford golf team for many years. Wow. And we spoke, we spoke about sport and culture earlier, like, like the cultural element. And when you look at golf clubs as well, it's an interesting like, dynamic, isn't it? You've got the whole golf club thing. You've got to get maybe a member to get in the door. You've got to wear a, a special tie and have a strange handshake at the door. Was it like that for you or your father? I don't know about the strange handshake, but I do remember having a captain's tea off and, the, and they put some sheep on the, because well, it was my dad's dinner uh, when he was captain for the year. And we were all invited and they had a tea off and there were sheep on the green that, uh, because he's a farmer. So they made a little joke about having sheep there. So there were some funny little rituals and things that they do. I'm not sure about the handshake. Okay. Well, you're not sure about it because he never told you. Um, like the, um, the, the thing is, as well as about sport, is um, when you talk about um, uh, like maybe different levels of society. So golf, it'd be as one of those sports that's not as accessible as maybe other sports. And I guess possibly tennis as well, maybe. And football, rugby, these are sports that may be open more to the masses. And uh, let's come back to Danny. You've got loads of interesting things to say. What about that if you talk about maybe the social classes in sports and the sports they play? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, specifically in baseball, there are a lot of social classes. Um, so there are some players who make the team who are just uh, the villains or superstars. Um, and then there are those who are everyday players um, who are just the villains but are adequate enough to actually be part of the team. And uh, they make the cut and um, they basically help out as much as they can. And then you have the elitists, which are obviously the superstars who get the big dollar contracts, most of which get like probably 78 years for probably $218 million, which yeah. you know, you're like, wow, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think within like that, that dichotomy uh, exists a social case system of, well, you know, Danny, you're just a utility infielder and we'll call you in when half the team is injured. Or, you know, you are the star of the team and you're going to play every single solitary game whenever you're sick or something, we'll, we'll bring in Danny to help fill you in. And then you've got Michael, who's a superstar pitcher, and then whenever he pitched too many games, we'll throw in Marco whenever he needs some relief. 
So it's it's that kind of that foray of of, of uh, the the case system that they have, if you will. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, so that's within the sport itself, which is interesting as well. All right, great. Well, let's let's crack on. Let's move forward. I'll bring up the next video, and uh, I think this is another native English speaker. Let's listen to this. She's won 23 Grand Slam singles titles over her blockbuster career. And she has bounced back from major injuries to win international titles. And she's persevered to become one of the top tennis players in history. But Serena Williams is also an entrepreneur and an investor. And her tennis career has prepared her well for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Please welcome the one and only Serena Williams. Sorry, I can't skip forward in this video. I'll give it a few seconds and we're going to be able to hear her speak. All right. Um, welcome. Hey, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> so as I was just saying, um, Serena, today, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurship. Everybody knows you're a tennis champion, but few people know all of the other stuff that you're working on. So I'm just gonna quickly lay it out for all of you. Um, and uh, there's a variety of things around tech, fashion, and venture capital. So you're the founder and CEO of S by Serena, a fashion brand you've been working on basically your whole life. Um, you're the board member of Pop. Right. In uh, lesson lesson number one in running events, um, when using slides.com, you cannot embed a uh, a video which starts at a particular time. So when you, you know when you can share a YouTube link and you say start at like two minutes, I've just learned something new today. You can't do that when embedding in slides.com. So for the <laughs> Can you, have, can you have videos that autoplay in slides.com? You can. Um, and okay. that's what I just did. But yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I can't jump forward. So for the Italian is yeah. all space, the Italian is all space, you might want to bear that in mind. But uh, we, we actually opened the conversation there to philanthropy and other things that sports stars can do. So that's another thing, isn't it, Danny? You mentioned about like, you know what we could do maybe after sports, after retirement. Philanthropy. Uh, what about that? I mean, I guess that's one of the more satisfying things you could do with all your time. Yeah, it is. Um, not to take this, uh, not to switch gears and, and turn this into a non-sports related uh, talk, but a good example of somebody who retires and does something um, very, um, very passionately, if anything, and gives back to the community uh, would be the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, they have done so much for education and so much for the STEM curriculum uh, here in the United States uh, and those who have been hit hard with natural disasters, specifically in Haiti and um, around the world and, and in Puerto Rico. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a really, really good, uh, you know, um, epitome of what one can do in a positive manner outside of just self-advertising their own self and being just like Ronaldo was. <laughs> Excuse myself, but I just had to. <laughs> Yeah, great point. What about you, Daniel? I mean, um, that's probably one of the really satisfying things about becoming successful with money and uh, fame in, in some ways. If you can go and help other people like these uh, Serena Williamses and, and also David Beckham as well. Um, again, I, uh, I don't feel famous and I don't, uh, I'm not swimming in money. <laughs> I can only imagine what it's like. <laughs> um, I would say that I feel successful in the fact that um, the work we're starting is reaching a lot of people in a way that is meaningful for them. That is very satisfying. Um, and that 
I feel like I found my life's work. You know, whether this ever turns into a lot of money or not is completely beside the point to me. I would like, obviously, for that to happen, but as long as I'm doing this work in the way that means a lot to a lot of people, then I feel successful. That's my measure for success. At the yeah. moment. Sure. Um, Serenity, what about sports for you yourself? So you spoke about your daughter and your, your dad. What, what about you? Have you ever played any sport? I was very good at sport at school. Um, but the thing was, I was into both sport and music, so um, I had to choose one or the other, and I, I went into the music side of things as a, a music teacher for the last 32 years. So the sport mm -hmm. went by the by, but at school we had uh, three sports in the winter and three sports in the summer, basically. So that would include uh, netball, badminton, and hockey in the winter, and in the summer it was tennis, athletics, and uh, what was the other one? Swimming. Very nice. Okay. And um, you, we heard from uh, Danny earlier in his uh, US English. What about you in your British English? Could you just explain to us the pros and the cons of team sports versus individual sports, just so people out there can get a flavour of how you would express that as a native speaker from England? Uh, uh, let me see. Well... I think I'd seen it more recently when my daughter was younger. She was also a football player, a goalkeeper for her team. Um, they develop a, a, a sim, is this right, symbiosis? I want to say that's a correct word, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think well, so. something like that. Um, they develop friendships, they develop bonds, they develop a kind of almost a telepathy for who should be where and who should be filling a space. Um, and what works for them, what doesn't work. Um, her team for a, a long while, when it was first formed, didn't do well at all. I mean, we were kind of bottom of the league. But by the time we got to our third year, we actually won the the uh, the league, amazingly, to um, teams who weren't who thought we were rubbish and we, we weren't in the end. So I was there as parent supporter. Um, <laughs> I actually had to, my role was, I had to wear a yellow jacket sometimes and make sure the parents behaved, <laughs> that we didn't have any dads shouting. Okay. <laughs> Strange Yeah, thing. they're often the but worst I, I ones, what, the mum and dad's yes. on the sideline. Oh, absolutely, they were. I had to make sure they, I, I was crowd control. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right, that. great. Um, but I love <laughs> seeing the girls develop their relationships and their friendships and seeing where they are now as well. And now they're all in their mid-twenties. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, everybody. Right, we, uh, we're we going to finish this particular lesson in the next uh, 60 seconds or so. And so this is just a quick flavour again of how you might be able to incorporate um, other accents. For example, and unfortunately, we didn't get to listen to Serena Williams, but when learning English, and I appreciate this video is going out on YouTube, so even if people aren't here, they're going to be able to understand maybe how they might be able to approach these topics as everyday topics like sports, maybe in a different way, uh, and how they might be able to use those in the language learning classroom, for example. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's the message from today. Is just to uh, uh, try to have the tour around the English uh, speaking world because it's not just about me uh, speaking Southern British English, not just about Daniel with his Welsh accent or Soretti, uh, but it's also about people like Danny Salerno, who's to my left with uh, his American English. It's about Michael, who was here earlier talking uh, English with his Italian accent, and we've got Canadians in the house as well. So you know, that's what it's all about. And um, subjects like sport obviously really bring people together on the playing fields, but also in conversations as well so we're going to leave it there for the moment I'm going to jump forward now to the uh, the, the final uh, the, the news slide which is uh, touring the news so there's been a lot made about the news recently obviously the big C coronavirus but we will not be looking at those topics today not really in this class uh, in this upcoming class of our number four of 24 it's going to be some of the other stories hitting the world news in the last seven uh, days and uh, and so yeah we'll be back in another three or four minutes to kick that off and uh, look forward to hearing your opinions again so uh, I'll see you in another three or four minutes feel free to mingle back in a moment